thank you so much, Martina, for welcoming BMI into your studio here in Nashville. We want to start by talking about your new album. So how is this album different from your others, and how did releasing it independently change the process of making it? Well, the album is, you know, it's different in, in the fact that it's, it's uh, a compilation record of some of my favorite um, iconic soul and R&B and pop songs, some of which have crossed over to country as well. But um, it was just a really fun record to make, kind of to make a record not, I don't know, I guess not really worrying about radio or hit singles, but just really making a record that, I just wanted to make a record that was fun and easy to listen to and, you know, really paid tribute to these great songs. As far as releasing it on my own label, it didn't feel a lot different. You know, I've always been involved in the business side of things when it comes to um, the re my business and making records. And so I guess um, the only difference was just you were kind of responsible for it. I was kind of responsible for everything. And um, But I got to put together a great team and handpick my team. And, you know, it was a great experience. What makes you want to cut a song? For me, when I think, when I consider which songs to record, they have to resonate with me, you know, in some way. Sometimes it's a lyric, sometimes it's a melody, but it's great when they're when they come together and, and they both do that. For Forever Lasting, I chose the songs. There's so many songs, you know. It's like a treasure hunt, really. Of with with all, it's all treasure. So it's just finding the ones that fit my voice the best, that I felt like I could sing authentically and inhabit the song and really um, make my own. And so it was, you know, we, we had a, I listened for seven or eight months to just thousands and thousands of songs and then narrowed it down to about 25 that I sat down with the piano, just piano and vocal. And it was just kind of obvious which ones fit and which ones seemed a little awkward. It's like, I always say it's like, if you have a rack of beautiful gowns, you know, and you're getting ready for an award show and they're all so beautiful and you look through and you're like, oh my gosh, these are so amazing. But then when you start trying them on, you know, some look better on you than others and they're more flattering and they just fit better. So that's kind of like it is with music and with songs. Well, what I love about this record is that it kind of goes back to a time when there weren't such strict genres on and labels on music. You know, you had... Ray Charles making this amazing country record because he loved country music, and he said, "There's really not that much difference between the blues and country music. You know, it's 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 very much about people's emotions and and saying things in a very simple way that everybody can understand." And um, then you know we had Patsy Cline and Jim Reeves on pop radio, and I think there's always been songs and artists that have crossed over, and and still you know there there are those artists that are just you really can't classify them in any genre, like Elvis. You know, he was gospel, R&B, country, rock and roll. Um, Buddy Holly was the same way. Uh, so I think that there's there have always been songs and artists that have kind of encompassed a lot of different, just, just music in general without really being labeled as any one thing, or, or they defied being labeled. You know, you couldn't really p pigeonhole them into a category. So for me, that's what I love about this record is I just approached it very open-hearted and open-minded and just really wanted to revisit that time when we, you know, it's, is it a country record? Well, there are songs on it that have crossed, that have been country hits as well as R&B hits and pop hits. I mean, they were simultaneously almost this, you know, on both charts by different artists because it, because back then people recorded each other's songs and it was just much freer. And so that was the fun part for me about making this record was kind of revisiting that time when we didn't worry so much about fitting everything into a little box. Right. And you didn't just choose, quote, vintage songs to sing on this album. You used vintage equipment, too. Mm -hmm. And um, you pretty much captured the live sound of a four-piece band. Was this your idea or something that came about from working with producer Don Was? And what was working with Was like? Yeah. Working with Don is amazing. He's very... Um, He's very free and very, you know, he's a musician himself. So he knows how to talk to the musicians. He's, he was out on the floor uh, of the, you know, he was out in the room when we were recording. Um, we recorded this band all in one room. And I think that made a huge difference because everybody could see everybody as well as hear everybody. So, you know, one thing that Don said um, uh, to the musicians when we started making this record was that, 
to, to listen to each other and to listen to, to the singer, me, and really play off of each other's emotion. And, and the thing about having a four piece band is that every part is important. And so people are all, everything that they play played was really tasteful and, and important to the song. There was no extra kind of, you know, no extra instruments or no extra thing to, to take away from the focus of just this beautiful music bed for these lyrics and the song. And um, it was a great experience recording that way. And my husband, John McBride, was the engineer. And he's, that's his kind of specialty is really recording artists, I mean, recording bands. Just, I mean, really what you hear on that record is what happened. There's not a lot, any manipulation of sound or there weren't a lot of overdubs or editing, you know? It was really, that was really what happened on the tracking day. Mm -hmm.